Hi everyone, it's uh, David Feidler. I'm the editor of uh, the Stoic Insights website, and it's my pleasure to be speaking with Massimo Pellucci today. Uh, Massimo is the K.D. Arani Professor of Philosophy at the City College of New York, and uh, if you follow Stoicism at all, uh, you must be familiar with his book, How to Be a Stoic, which is a fantastic book. He's the author of A Manual for New Stoics with uh, Gregory Lopez, which is a collection of 52 Stoic philosophical and psychological practices, one for uh, each week of the year, uh, designed to help the reader uh, improve their character, which was one of the main goals of uh, Stoicism as a philosophy. And today, uh, we're going to be speaking about uh, Massimo's new book, A Field Guide to the Happy Life, uh, 53 uh, Brief Lessons for Living. So, uh, welcome, Massimo. It's uh, great to see you again. It's a pleasure to be here, David. <laughs> yes. Uh, I first met Massimo and his wife, uh, his beautiful wife, Jennifer, at the Speaker's Dinner for Stoicon uh, in Athens, which was actually 11 months ago, I guess. And yeah. it seemed like it was uh, a lifetime ago, ago <laughs> because of the pandemic. So that does something really yeah. strange to everyone's sense of time. And we had a good conversation uh, uh, because uh, Massimo's wife is into Ralph Waldo Emerson. And uh, I brought up mm -hmm. the fact about how Emerson, his literary style was actually influenced by Seneca, unless we're all wrong about that. But we all seem to agree about that. Yep. But in any case, uh, let's get into discussing Massimo's uh, new book. And um, so Massimo, it seems that everyone who becomes interested in Stoicism has a favorite Roman uh, Stoic. And uh, your favorite Stoic, obviously, is uh, Epictetus, the philosopher Epictetus. And I was wondering, could you tell us uh, what specifically drew you to Epictetus? And also, why do you feel that Stoicism, a 2,000-year-old philosophy, uh, might need some updating today? Well, you're right. It's, it is definitely Epictetus. And, um, you know, all three of my books, in, in some sense, I have a lot to do with Epictetus. How to be a Stoic was imagined as an ongoing conversation with Epictetus. I, would, I imagine to be walking down the Roman Forum uh, during the reign of Nero um, and, uh, and having these conversations with Epictetus for, uh, on, on all sorts of practical um, and theoretical topics about Stoicism. The second one, the handbook uh, with Gret Lopez, uh, or How to Live Like a Stoic for the UK, uh, market is, uh, as, you, as you mentioned, uh, 52 exercises, but the exercises are organized along, along the three disciplines of Epictetus. So there are three chunks, one for the discipline of desire and aversion, one for the discipline of action, and one for the discipline of ascent. And then this final book is really my homage to Epictetus because it's nothing other than a perhaps presumptuous rewriting of the Enchiridion. <laughs> so, uh, and I guess we'll, we'll get to talk about that in a, in a, in a minute. What drew me to Epictetus? Well, when I started getting interested in Stoicism, it just happened that the first Stoic that I read was Epictetus, even though many, many years earlier in college, I read Marcus Aurelius, like a lot of people. Um, and, and in fact, even before that, in high school, I had translated Seneca from Latin, and yet I never somehow put the two together. I never thought that Seneca and Marcus Aurelius were somehow, you know, pretty deeply interconnected, nor did I ever think that this was about a general philosophy of life. And, you know, to me, it was just like, oh, that's an interesting book from a Roman emperor, or, oh, that's an interesting essay by a Roman senator. But that, that was about it. <clears throat> then when I got into Stoicism, uh, I realized sort of the connections be, be, be among these people. And then I, I downloaded one, I, one of the early materials that I read was, uh, was in fact, the discourses. And one, one of the very first quotes that I still remember from Epictetus, from the discourses, is something along the lines of, um, well, um, if I had to die, then, then I have to die, but it doesn't look like I'm dying now, therefore we need to go out for lunch. It's like, like what? wait, what? Who, who is this guy who has an obviously wicked sense of humor, a, a sense of reality and priorities, um, and, and he's just like, and he talks in a very, very understandable, very comprehensible way. So I really got into it. And the more I got into Epictetus, the more I think he's, he's really, he was really a brilliant uh, philosopher, even though, as you know, we don't actually have anything that he wrote. At least Marcus and Seneca, we have stuff that they wrote. Epictetus didn't write anything, apparently. All we have are the discourses, which only half of which actually survived, four out of the original eight volumes. And we have the little Enchiridion, the manual, 
both of them were actually compilations by his, uh, by Epictetus' most brilliant student and most famous student, Arian of Nicomedia. So we had to kind of trust that that Arian got it right. <laughs> you know, I, I I would be nervous if the only thing that survived after my death were notes from my students. <laughs> 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 of course, once being dead, you know, there's no point in warning about anything. But nevertheless, it's like uh, the thought while alive would kind of bother me. Um, but we do know that Arian actually was a very good philosopher and historian in his own right. He wrote a, a history of Alexander the Great. He was, um, you know, he, he was a really serious guy. And what he tried to do was not to give us a systematic uh, sort of um, understanding or, or exposition of Epictetus doctrines, what we get there is really snippets of dialogue from Epictetus classroom, which on the one hand, on the one hand is like, oh, I really wish I had a complete treatise by Epictetus, you know, about his whole system instead of having to sort of put it together bit by bit from different parts of the discourses. Uh, but on the other hand, it's like, wow, I get an actual first person account of what it was like to be in Epictetus classroom in Nicopolis in Northwestern uh, Greece. So, so it's fascinating. And, and, you know, I got, I, I fell in love with Epictetus everything, even though I actually disagree with a number of things that Epictetus says in the discourses and, uh, and the uh, Enchiridion, which is, uh, it was already clear in how to be a Stoic. There is an entire chapter where I disagree with Epictetus on certain things. And it's even more clear in the new book uh, where, <laughs> I depart from a, a number of things that Epictetus was saying or suggesting. Right. Uh, the thing that I always uh, found to be a bit fun about this uh, uh, kind of in an ironic way is that uh, you were brought up Catholic, but you consider yourself to be an atheist now. And of all the Roman uh, Stoics, Epictetus is the one who <laughs> talks about God the most and sounds actually right. like a Christian, which That's none right. of the Stoics really looked at God in that way. But of all of them, Epictetus uh, talks about God the most. So I think it's interesting. Uh, yeah. just I, you know, I consider that, um, uh, if, if you allow me, uh, you know, a, a, that, that should give me points in terms of open-mindedness. Because yes. it really is, for an atheist, it really is, a, you know, kind of jarring when you start reading Epictetus. It's like God here and God there. Of course, then you realize that what he's talking about is nothing like the Christian God. Um, he's actually referring to the Stoic God. The Stoics were pantheists. Uh, God was essentially the universe itself, which was understood as a living organism endowed with the logos, the ability to, you know, to be rational. But nevertheless, you're right. Compared to uh, Marcus and Seneca, he's, he's definitely, you know, the God stuff is definitely there. I mean, uh, Seneca very rarely f uh, mentions God. He often refers to fortune. Uh, yes. as, his, as his opponent, basically. Um, and although Marcus Aurelius does refer to God, he also has a number of several passages in the meditations where he talks about gods or atoms, right? So he's, he's uh, considering, on the one hand, the Stoic metaphysics, there is a God that is the living organism of the universe, that is the universe, and, or Epicurean metaphysics. It's just atoms bumping into the void. And though, although it's clear that Marcus is not agnostic on the question, he's, he's definitely on the Stoic side of things, he actually contemplates uh, the, the possibility that the Epicureans might be right, and then he concludes each time that, well, you know, even if the Epicureans are right, I still have to get up in the morning and do my job as a human being and be helpful to the human cosmopolis and all that sort of stuff. So he doesn't seem to, to see a, much of a problem uh, in, in letting go of the, sto the notion of Stoic God. Right, the Stoics were always uh, pretty pragmatic, as you said in the story about Epictetus, you know, having his lunch and when it comes time to die, I'll die. Um, so anyways, uh, I really enjoyed the book. And the thing that I liked about it the most is that uh, there are some parts where you present Epictetus's ideas uh, much more clearly than you would find in any contemporary translations. And there are places where Epictetus's ideas uh, really shine through with incredible clarity. And for that reason alone, I think everyone uh, with an interest in Stoicism should read this book. Uh, I do think it, a lot of people will find this to be controversial in some way, which is something that you actually mentioned in the book. Um, but uh, after I read it, I was thinking about it. And actually, this uh, reminds me in a sense of the so-called Jefferson Bible. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm not an expert on Thomas Jefferson, uh, really, in much of any way. But uh, he was a big reader of the Stoics. And uh, when he died, he actually had Seneca's letters open on his uh, bedside table. Uh, which obviously is a mark in his favor. And uh, the thing about Jefferson is that um, 
he was a Christian, but uh, he wasn't uh, religious in a conventional sense. He thought that the moral teachings of Jesus were among uh, the highest uh, moral teachings produced by humanity, but he didn't believe at all in miracles or superstition. He was very rational and scientific like you are. And Jefferson was a, a deist, and deism in a sense is very close to the thought of the Stoic philosophers too, because they all believed that there was some kind of uh, rationality behind the world reflected in the laws of nature, but that uh, this idea of God that they had, this kind of God didn't interfere with the world in any way. So uh, the God of deism, like the God of Stoicism, is just a kind of rationality behind the universe. It's not a personal God that you could probably pray to or certainly have a personal relationship with. But what Jefferson did uh, was he created his own Bible and he he cut parts out of, uh, you know, the Bible in four different languages or the Gospels rather. And he kept only the moral teachings of Jesus, but he literally cut out all the miracle stories, anything superstitious, anything relating to the resurrection. And there's a very good article about this on Wikipedia in case anyone wants to read about it. And uh, when I was thinking about your book, it struck me as being a very similar project, a field guide to the happy life, where you're trying to update Epictetus. And uh, there are two differences though between what Jefferson did and what you've done. The first is that obviously you're dealing with two different texts. He was dealing with the gospels and you're dealing with Epictetus. But the other difference is that you actually change the text of Epictetus, whereas Jefferson just cut things out, and you're adding your own ideas to the text to bring it up to date. So this makes me wonder, uh, since you're adding material to Epictetus, do you see him as being a co-author in some way, or do you see this as being entirely mm -hmm. your own work, kind of you know, inspired by him? Right. No, that's that's a great question. Now, I definitely see him as a co-author or, or as such a direct and obvious and acknowledged in the book uh, inspiration that it's hard to tell. Uh, in fact, if you read the book, the central part of you know, the, the bulk of the book is the 53 sections, which uh, mirror the 53 original sections in the Enchiridion. And if you just read them, just read that part without the introduction or the or the or the uh, conclusion, uh, you wouldn't be able to tell. I mean, I would challenge anybody to tell wh where Epictetus begin ends and, and where I begin, which is why the, there is an appendix at the, at the end of the book where actually details, you know, section for section. Uh, it's like, okay, here's what Epictetus actually said. Here's what I, I say, just, just because obviously I don't want to confuse people. In fact, the project here is one of a, trying to update Stoicism and particularly Epictetus Stoicism uh, to the 21st century. Let me go back to Jefferson for a second because that, that's an interesting analogy. So Jeff, Jefferson was an Epicurean apparently, um, although he did read widely, um, as, you, as you mentioned. And he also had a copy of the Enchiridion, which he donated to the University of Virginia Library. So he knew quite a bit about, about Stoicism, I, even though he preferred you know, the Epicureans. And, you know, no, not everybody is, you know, not everybody can be perfect or something like that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but there is an analogy, but there's also an analogy there with something that, so this thing that I've been with the Encaridion has actually been done before, several times. The Encaridion was highly influential throughout the Middle Ages with Christian theologians. Uh, and in fact, it was rewritten at, or updated or changed or modified at least three times uh, throughout the Middle Ages. Uh. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was used as a training manual, you know, for, for monks, for, for Christian monks, uh, where, of course, every mention of Socrates was, you know, replaced by Jesus or something like that. But, but nevertheless, uh, pretty much the same structure with certain things cut out or, or changed, modified, etc. cetera. Um, and so, and there are even more recent attempts uh, to update uh, or re rephrase the Encarnation. What is important to, to uh, however, appreciate in this particular effort of mine is this is not a new translation because there are excellent translations out there of Epictetus. I, I wouldn't dare <laughs> going against any of those, of those people. Uh, the Robin Hart translation for Oxford Press is, I, my, my opinion, the best one. Although a very close competitor is Anthony Long's uh, translation for Princeton University Press. So it's like there's plenty of stuff out there by actual scholars of ancient philosophy. There's no question if, that if anybody wants a good version of the Enchiridion, they, they can find it. But as you say, what it, what's happening in, in the field guide is a attempt to, first of all, bring Epictetus himself to a new audience 
in terms of explaining his ideas in a much more clear and cogent way using modern examples and modern language. That I think it's important because even the best translation still sounds in some sense, you know, like ancient philosophy, <laughs> because it is ancient philosophy, right? It's like you're still reading something that was written 18 centuries ago or 19 centuries ago. So, so even just to paraphrase Epictetus, so long as you do it carefully, you know, doing justice to what he was saying, I think it's a valuable uh, contribution to the modern literature because, because Stoicism, just like any other philosophy or religion, uh, constantly goes through updates. I mean, think about, you know, you just mentioned, of course, the, the, the Jefferson Bible, but, you know, no, I would wager that no Christian today, even fundamentalist Christians today, are Christian in the same way in which people were Christian 2,000 years ago. It just, it's just not the case. You know, the, the, the religion has evolved, even though religions tend to be conservative in terms of their evolution, because, of course, they have, you know, the disadvantage of, of dealing with the Bible is that that's literally scripture. That's supposed to be the, the word of God. I don't treat Epictetus as scripture or, or Marcus or as a scripture, right? So I can take much more liberty uh, with it. But think also of Buddhism, for instance. You know, the Buddhism that we, the people practice today, both in the East and the West, is just certainly not what it was two, two and a half millennia ago and so on and so forth. In the case of Stoicism, something funny happened on, on, on the way to the forum, so to speak, uh, which is Stoicism actually existed as a school of thought, as an independent school of thought and well-articulated school of thought for about five centuries, five centuries, from the late fourth century BCE, you know, about 300 BCE uh, with Zeno of Sidium in Athens up until the, the late second century, maybe early third century uh, in, with the Roman Empire. I mean, Marcus Aurelius is the last great Stoic that we know of, although we know that there are a few others after him, but not that many. Then after that, we don't really hear about Stoicism per se, other than through the commentaries and rebuttals and all that of, of Christian authors. Then Stoicism, uh, in, uh, the original uh, early Stoicism, reemerges during the Renaissance. The first translation, uh, for instance, of the Enchiridion in Latin is from the 1400s. It's from, uh, by Poliziano, who was working at the uh, at the court of the Medici in, uh, in Florence. And then the first English translation is you know, about a century later. So, so then re it, Stoicism reemerges. Seneca um, has was, uh, played a major role in, the, in a brief period called Neo-Stoicism, which was a movement that was trying to reconcile Stoicism and Christianity during the Renaissance, like in the 1500s. Um, by uh, mostly spearheaded by Justus Lipsis. So, so Stoicism reemerged, but when it did reemerge, again, it was not really updated. It was like, okay, let me see what Seneca is, is talking about here. Let me see if I can. So there is an, in, there is an interrupted tradition, basically, in Stoicism of, you know, almost 18 centuries, 17, 18 centuries, during which people just took the original and then they used it for their own purposes, so they reinterpreted their own purpose, but didn't try to really update it. Um, as, in, as on the other hand, as ha happened organically uh, for other traditions like Christianity, Buddhism, and so on and so forth. So my attempt, and I'm not the only one, uh, uh, obviously, my attempt is to resume that interrupted tra tradition and, and modify things and update things while maintaining the spirit, in my mind at least, the spirit of the original Stoicism, but update it because both the science and the philosophy have moved on in the meantime. They, they, you know, there are new, new things that have come up. When I say I'm not the only one, like the, the, the major attempt so far at systematically updating Stoicism is uh, Lawrence Baker's A New Stoicism. You know, Larry died just a, a couple of years ago and uh, he was a friend and, and he was an incredible scholar. It, it, his attempt really is comprehensive. Uh, it's, it's really amazing. However, Larry's book is really difficult to read. If you don't have background, not just in Stoicism, but in, in philosophy and in fact, even in logic, um, good luck to you. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> this is not going to be, it's not an easy, not an easy read. And in fact, because, and he was aware of it. And because of that, um, if uh, people go and check out my uh, archive, the blog, how to be a stoic.org, they'll find that chapter by chapter commentary on Larry's book, which was approved by Larry, um, you know, before he died, because I want to make sure that I got the thing right. Because even I was stumped a couple of times when I was reading, you know, his book. There are other attempts in a, sen in a sense, all of the modern authors of Stoicism are not just presenting Stoicism, they are reinterpreting, right? So Bill Irvine, Donald Robertson, John Sellers, all of these people it, to, to a different degree. But I think that Larry's attempt is by far the most systematic. In my case, uh, I, don't, I didn't take on the entire Stoic system. 
uh, I took on just the Epictetus, um, and and I did it on the basis of the Enchiridion. So so it's a it's a more modest attempt, but nevertheless, I figured that I, we had to start somewhere and make it accessible in some way, and uh, and that's how it how it came out. So a lot of what it's there, you know, about half of the material that it's there is is. Epictetus himself just re reinterpreted, updated in terms of language and examples. The other half, on the other hand, is inspired by Epictetus, uh, but it is, in fact, my thinking. Incidentally, um, I also wanted to mention that this is nothing new. The Stoic themselves, during the high period, you know, the, the, the early period of Stoics and the, the ancient period of Stoics is usually by scho scholars, usually divided into three uh, periods, the early which very unimaginatively are, co are called the early Stoic, the middle Stoic, and the late Stoic. <laughs> The early store was uh, centered in Athens, and we're talking about Zeno, Citium, Cleanthes, Chrysippus, all of those people. Uh, the middle store was actually scattered throughout the Mediterranean because around 86 BCE, the, the Roman general Sulla went into Athens, destroyed the whole damn thing. And, um, and as a result, there was a diaspora of philosophers, not just Stoic philosophers, but, you know, and so people went to Alexandria in Egypt, they went to Rhodes, they went to Rome, of course. The Middle Stoicism is characterized mostly by two figures, Panicius and Posidonius. Posidonius in particular is important because he was a teacher of, of Cicero. That's how Cicero, who was not a Stoic, learned a lot about Stoicism and became sympathetic to Stoicism. And then the, the late Stoic is the big ones, right? Musonius Rufus, Epictetus, Marcus Aurelius, Seneca. But the fact is, throughout that period, there were disagreements inside the store, and people were doing and ch changing things. There were early stories who, for instance, dropped both the study of physics, meaning natural, natural philosophy, and logic, and just focused on the, on the ethics. There were others that you know, rejected some one or the other of Zeno's teaching. Chrysippus himself, who was the third head of the store, changed the system so radically that uh, Diogenes Laertius in, in the lives and opinions of the uh, eminent philosopher says that without Chrysippus, there would be no Stoa, uh, right? So because he completely systematized, changed, uh, made more coherent the entire system. And then there is Seneca. Seneca has this beautiful passage in one of the letters to Lucilius where he says, look, you notice that I, I modify these ideas. I pick from other people. You know, he, he qu often quotes Epicurus. He says, that's because... I don't consider those that preceded us to be my masters. They were, they are my teachers. But, you know, if I have new ideas, if I find a new path, if I discover new truths, it's, uh, it's important for me to put them forth. And so I'm, in a sense, immodestly follow, following Seneca's advice and doing the same thing. It's like, well, you know, in the meantime, almost two millennia have passed. And yes, we do have a, a little bit better understanding of the world and we should put it to use. Right. Um, <clears throat> actually, um, you and I have a lot of things in common because we both have PhDs in philosophy and we've both studied science. You studied evolutionary biology. My background is actually in the history of astronomy and cosmology. So that includes, you know, mathematics and physics and things like that. And you know, when I was a kid, I wanted to become an astronomer. Uh-huh. Yes. That was my first uh, goal. I wasn't, I, I had an astronomical observatory in, in, uh, when I lived in the United States, it was unbelievable. I've been into astronomy ever since I was a kid. Um, and both of us are very drawn to uh, Stoicism. We both practice it, you know, in our own ways. Um, but I find that I take a slightly different approach to the Stoics than you do, because um, what, what I tend to think is that um, most everyone today basically is a modern Stoic. Uh, <laughs> I don't think there really are any sort of like entirely traditional Stoics, because for example, I've never met anyone interested in Stoicism who thought that we should own slaves or go out and sacrifice a <laughs> Zeus. I've just haven't met anyone like that. But the well, I wonder why. <laughs> <laughs> the, the approach that I take is that uh, instead of like trying to rewrite Stoicism, what I do is, uh, of course, you know, things have changed in terms of our understandings of, you know, science and human nature, and we've had cultural changes and things like that. And you actually list seven different uh, areas where you've made changes, which hopefully when we get to the end of the interview, we'll be able to cover those maybe. But um, my, my own approach is that I just basically, when I read the Stoics, I, I focus on what is useful. And I find that actually there's a very small amount that I don't really agree with. And I just basically ignore that and, and write it off as being, you know, just the fact that things have evolved. So personally, I don't feel that need to like rewrite things so much as, as opposed to just sort of draw upon what I find to uh, 
uh, be useful. That's just my own. No, that's that's perfectly reasonable. And as you say, a lot of people actually do that, whether they do it consciously or not. Um, you know, even people like uh, uh, Chris Fisher, for instance, who is a prominent so-called traditional Stoic, right? He, he runs an, an entire separate kind of organization that is devoted to traditional Stoicism. But what he means by traditional is that he's a pantheist and he believes that uh, you have to accept the uh, Stoic notion of God, otherwise uh, certain things fall out of the Stoic system and you're not really a Stoic anymore. Obviously, I disagree with Chris, but that is, there is an example of a traditional Stoic. But even Chris, I'm pretty sure, wouldn't, own, wouldn't want to owe slaves and, you know, no. or, or talk about women the way in which Seneca sometimes does, you know, or, or something like that. So, yeah, you're absolutely right. Uh, it might be more systematic simply because that's my personality. I like uh, systematizing ideas. I like, um, you know, putting together things that, that are as coherent as, as, as possible. Um, understanding from the beginning, again, that this is a dynamic process that has been going on really from the onset of stoicism. And then my contribution isn't certainly, it's not, it's not going to be uncontroversial, as you pointed out, there's going to be people who are going to disagree possibly vehemently uh, with what I write. Uh, and it definitely is not going to be the last one. Uh, right. So, so, in fact, I hope it's not going to be the last one because that would be the end of, of Stoicism as a, li as a living philosophy. I, there, I'm sure there will be uh, probably in my own lifetime, but certainly after and other people who would look at Stoicism from a point of view of the 22nd or 23rd century or something like that and say, mm, okay, there is a lot of stuff that is interesting here. However, uh, let me see how can I actually bring it together in a coherent fashion to what it is our this modern understanding of, of things. Right. And actually, that was my feeling is that you're actually drawn toward systematic philosophy. And that was why you really wanted to uh, undertake this project. Um, I'd actually like to just briefly discuss uh, three stoic ideas that some people find to be controversial. And mm -hmm. you uh, accept the first two ideas, but you reject the third one. And uh, I was thinking about these recently because I'm writing a book about Seneca for uh, W.W. W. Norton. And there's a chapter in it called Why You Should Never Complain. And it starts off about uh, with sort of the common psychological reasons and also common sense reasons from today why you should never complain about things. Like it's a total waste of time, et cetera, et cetera. You can come up with your own list. But I think the readers of this chapter are going to find it to be very surprising because the Stoics had their own reason about uh, why you shouldn't complain about things based on the nature of the cosmos. And right. so there are three principles in Stoicism, logos, fate, and providence. And I just wanted to go through these quickly. Uh, you discuss all of these in your book. So logos is the idea that rationality or intelligence exists both in nature and human beings, uh, which is not really a controversial idea. So uh, that's not really in conflict with science. Fate sounds like it might be in conflict with science, but that's just the chain of cause and effect and determinism that you find in nature, which basically was classical physics in the time of Newton. So that's not controversial. Now, providence uh, is potentially controversial, and that's something that you reject. Uh, the Greek term for providence is pronoia or foreknowledge. And it is important, as you point out in your book, to realize that it's totally different from what they meant by providence in Christianity, which I think, I haven't really studied it, but I think the Christian idea is that God is watching over every individual in some right. way or something like that. But for the Stoics, it actually seemed to be a biological idea, actually right. like logos. Um, most people who study Stoicism don't realize that they were actually I'll just throw this in as a footnote for the philosophy nerds out there, but there were actually two different traditions of logos in, in uh, Greek philosophy. One was the Stoic idea, which was primarily biological, but there was another idea, which was from the Pythagoreans and Platonic tradition that was primarily mathematical. Yeah. And it was actually the Platonic and Pythagorean tradition that really influenced early Christianity. Most people don't know that, but that's, that's true. Sometimes they overlap. And of course, you know, they, they knew about the Stoics as well. But it seems to me that um, Providence, the way the Stoics saw it, was sort of like a, 
uh, a biological uh, intelligence that would be like an aspect of um, logos or just basically intelligence. So if you look at an organism, uh, organisms know how to heal themselves. And for example, uh, the whole organism guides the parts of the organism in some way. So if you cut your hand, your body knows how to heal the hand. And if you cut off the head of a flatworm, the flatworm can grow a new head, which is pretty remarkable. So I think there's like a weak and a strong version of maybe what the Stoics meant by providence. And the weak version is just that like a biological organism works as a whole to maintain or heal itself, which is pretty uncontroversial. Most people would agree with that. And then the strong version would be the universe works as a whole to benefit the entire universe, which I'm not sure really how comforting that is because pretty much in terms of an organism, the cells are um, irrelevant, but I think it might be possible, but a lot of people would find that to be controversial uh, because of it doesn't correspond to like the mechanistic worldview of the scientific revolution. Right. I think you might be able to, so what I was thinking is, um, I don't really go into this like in the book, but I was thinking about, is there any way that we could take a charitable view of this idea of providence and restate it in a scientific way that might be somehow acceptable? And one way that I thought of is that basically the universe operates as a coherent system. And we know from studying different systems in nature that you have bottom up causation like in organisms, but you also have top-down causation, which you find in organisms and actually in different physical systems in nature. And so maybe that could actually qualify as a modern version of what the Stoics meant by providence, which was concerned with the function of the overall universe uh, and not really for the benefit of the individual parts, but, but, the, but that the universe operates as a coherent whole. Yeah, no, those, those are all good, good points and good questions. So I don't think it's possible to recover stoic providence in any meaningful way. And that's, as you know, that's one part, one big chunk that I dropped from Epictetus, and it does have consequences in terms of the ethics. Um, so and maybe we'll get to that in a, in a minute. But let me go back to your three principles, logos, faith, and providence. I actually think that two of those are problematic, not just, not just uh, providence. Logos is also problematic in the way in which the Stoics understood it. There is a way to recover the notion of logos, I think, uh, but it's a very different notion from what the Stoics meant. And in fact, the, their notion of logos is directly related to the notion of providence that they had. So let's start with the easy one, fate. You're absolutely right. Fate is simply the, the, the universal web of cause and effect. Chrysippus did a, a lot of writing about the different levels of causality. I don't have any problem with that. Even though modern science, of course, uh, when, when, we're talking about, when we're talking about the level of fundamental physics, the, the notion of causality becomes a little fuzzy. It's not clear what causality means at the quantum level, for instance, or stuff like that. But for macroscopic phenomena, which are the ones, of course, that interest uh, us as living organisms, and particularly as moral agents, that's it. Cause and effect, it's a universal thing. <clears throat> And the Stoics pretty much got it right, particularly what, it be, what uh, Chrysippus got right, I think, was the interest, important, all important distinction between external causes and internal causes and how they interact. That's important because of the, of the Stoic notion of free will, which they didn't call free will. They called prohiresis or volition, right? Anthony Long translates it as volition, which is very, very good choice of words, actually. It's our ability to make decisions. And Chrysippus there is, I think, is perfectly right. He uses this analogy with a cylinder and he says you know so if you if you get a cylinder on the surface and you push it what happens well the cylinder is going to roll why is that the cylinder roll because i just pushed it well not exactly that's part of it that's the external cause but it's it, the cylinder rolls because it is in the internal nature of cylinders to roll if they're pushed if instead of a cylinder you push a cube the cube is not going to roll it may flip over or it may not move at all, but it's certainly not going to roll because it's not in the internal causality, causal system of the, the, of the cube to react in that way. The analogy there is with human beings, you know, why do we do certain things? Well, in part, it's because of causality from the outside. We're influenced by all sorts of, of things, both, both events and other people's opinions and so on and so forth. But what it means to be human is that we have a very complex internal uh, causal decision-making process. Um, that neurobiology is slowly uncovering. And so the result, the output in our actions is, is an inextricable complex combination of internal and external causes. And that's what it means to have volition. 
It's not free will, of course, because there's nothing free about it, uh, but it is volition. It's our ability to make decisions. And the important thing, as Larry Baker pointed out, uh, the, the major difference between us and the cylinder is that the cylinder's nature, internal nature is fixed. It cannot change. On the other hand, we are capable of applying reason recursively to itself. So to our past decisions, we can reflect and we can change things, always in a causal fashion. That, you know, there is no, there's no miracle involved here, but it does mean that we can actually change through time. We, our ability to make decisions improves through time or, or, or deteriorates through time, depending on, on, on the situation. So, right. fate, so we're actually part of the web of fate in a sense, yes, exactly. and that's why we can influence the world as well. So there is right. causality and determinism, but we're part of that web, and so we right. can influence the world. Correct. Because Which means that some modern philosophers uh, or writers, you know, often present the issue of free will as well. We're just puppets that are that are moved by the string of the universe. That's a bad analogy. Um, we're not puppets because part of that web of cause and effect, as you just said, goes through us. So, so if we're puppets, we actually do control some of our own strengths, or at least the way in which we react to external events. Um, again, without invoking any miracles, without invoking any sort of contra-causal free will or something like that. So, fate, I'm good. I, I think that the, the Stoics got it right. And that's a major chunk of their metaphysics, by the way. Um, you know, the fact that they were determinists, cause and effect, materialists, all of that stuff is important uh, in ancient Stoicism because it translates directly into modern Stoicism and it does affect the ethics. Um, you know, the people, people sometimes argue that, well, the ethics is entirely separate from the physics. It isn't. Uh, the Stoics very clearly thought that your ethics is, con is, is constrained by the way you understand the universe that's the physics, and by the way you think about uh, stuff, that's the logic. So you had to have all three. Now the other two, logos and providence, I, I think problematic, and they're problematic one because of the other. I think the providence is, stoic providence is problematic because of the stoic understanding of logos. So we need to, if you allow me a few minutes, we need to sort of lay out the ground here. Uh, when the Stoics are talking about logos as immanent in the universe, you know, this ability, log, the logos, first of all, is just one of the levels of pneuma, the breath, right? Breath is this substance that permeates the universe. And in certain uh, aspects, it's in one way of manifesting itself is the, high, the highest level of pneuma is the logos. And the logos means the ability to, you know, the, 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 to be rational. Now, obviously, human beings have it. No question about it. Um, However, the Stoics literally thought that the universe itself was a living organism endowed with the logos, right? Um, and it's interesting to see how they arrived at that. If you look at Cicero's um, On the Nature of the Gods, there are, there's a large chunk there where he explains several early Stoics' position about the logos and about providence. And it's fascinating because basically they're using two arguments. One is an argument from design or what we actually would recognize today as an argument from design. Epictetus himself does that in the discourses. He says uh, to one of his students, look, isn't it, it, doesn't the universe seem to work pretty much like uh, the, the, the sword fits into the scabbard? In other words, it's like, you know, all this stuff is just not random. It's just fun highly functional. It works in a certain way. Obviously, there is an intelligence behind it, right? That we recognize that today as the argument from design. In fact, Cicero tells us that all the three early Stoics, Zeno, Cleanthes, and Chrysippus, advanced different variants of the argument from design, which is great at the time. That was a perfectly reasonable argument. In fact, I'm pretty sure that if I'd been born in Athens, you know, around that time, or in Rome at the time of Epictetus, I would have bought into the argument from design, and I would have said to the Epicureans, you guys are nuts. There's, there's, there's no way. However, the argument from design followed, in my mind at least, uh, uh, fell after, after two big blows in modern times, right? David Hume in the 18th century, who showed that the argument is actually philosophically problematic, and more importantly, Charles Darwin in the 19th century, who actually proposed an alternative. He said, actually, it looks like the eye uh, or the lungs or the heart are designed, but actually they are the result of a natural process, you know, which we today understand as natural selection. Right. The way so, that I would phrase this is that actually there is design in nature because nature is full of design. But the question is, where did the design come from? And so, you know, the modern biological view is that life designed itself. Correct. And uh, there's, I, I was going to say there's this famous book. Uh, it's probably not famous, but it's called 
the evolutionary self-organizing universe by Eric Jantz, I believe. Mm -hmm. And so this is really the idea of modern science is that there is design in nature, but it's sort of like an emergent design that came out Correct. of the universe itself. Yeah. Correct. I like that way to put it, but it's very different from the way the Stoics right. thought about it. <clears throat> now, the second argument was interesting. So um, both Zeno um, and uh, later on, actually, even, uh, even Marcus Aurelius commit a fallacy there, which is called the fallacy of composition. So basically, Zeno ex explicitly says, well, of course, the universe is a living organism that is intelligent, because after all, part of the universe is living and intelligent. Therefore, that would be us. Therefore, the universe is living and intelligent. Now, that argument still today, I find people say here and say, yeah, that's right. I mean, that's correct, right? No, it isn't. It's a, it's a fallacy of composition. Just because it's a part of a system has certain properties, it doesn't mean that the whole system has the same properties, except in the trivial sense that, you know, the part, the parts have the, that, those properties, right? So, and vice versa, like a system can have some properties, which doesn't mean that the individual parts have, have those properties. Think of a, of a very simple physical example, water. Individual molecules of water are not wet. But water as a quantity of molecules under certain uh, pressure and temperature conditions is wet. So, but you cannot say that because water is in, in, in its uh, ensemble is wet, therefore every molecule is wet. It, it's not. And vice versa, the properties of the molecules, like charge of the electrons or something like that, are not the properties of the system. So if you look carefully at how the Stoic, why the Stoic arrived at that conclusion, uh, it turns out that it's by modern philosophical and scientific standards is incorrect. Now, that said, I do recognize, I, I, I mentioned a, minute ago, a few minutes ago, that there is a way to salvage the notion of, of Logos, but in a very different fashion. And to me, Logos, in a, in a modern fashion, simply means that the universe is, in fact, organized according to rational principles. But those rational principles emerge, as you were saying earlier, from what we consider the laws of nature, from, from, you know, from what we, uh, we refer to, generally speaking, as the laws of nature. And just, like in, just in the same way as design in the biological world emerges as a result of biophysical processes, um, the rationality of the universe, meaning the fact that it follows consistent uh, patterns of behavior, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, emerges from the still somewhat not completely understood uh, you know, laws of nature, but it's an emergence. It's not, it's not a property of the entire, entire system. Now, why all of this is relevant? You know, because we could, we could dismiss all of this and say, okay, but this is just an academic discussion. It's like, whatever, they call it logos, you know, tomato, tomato, potato, potato. It's like, what the hell, who cares? Uh, let's just call the, the whole thing quit. Well, no, because the problem is that the Stoics derived their notion of providence and a lot a, a certain important component of their ethics from it. How? Well, the um, Amor best Fati. way. Amor Fati. That's right, the Amor Fati, exactly. Which that's, of course, as you know, it's, it's Nietzsche's phrase much later on, but it, is, it does rec uh, uh, reflect the Stoic understanding. Love your fate, right? So before we get to love your fate, there's this issue of providence. Epictetus in particular is very clear about how to understand providence. Because Seneca doesn't really talk about providence. He talks about fate. He talks about fortune very much. Right? He says, well, you know, there's cause and effect. There's stuff going on you don't control. So you need to focus on your virtue because that's the part you control. That's great. That, I'm fine with that. No, not a problem. But Epictetus talks about providence. That's, in fact, why Epictetus, as you pointed out earlier at the beginning of our discussion, why Epictetus so often talks about God, right? Because he, he gets from the, from the living organism that is the universe that is God, he, he gets the notion of providence, which for him is important. And what does he mean by that? His best example, I mean, his best analogy is when he says, if you are a foot and you happen to step into, have to step into the mud because the body to which you belong has to cross the street and the street is muddy, you should do it. Now, if you, he says, if you look at it from the point of view of just the foot, you'd say, this is disgusting. This is awful. Why, why, why do I want to stab into the mud? But once you realize that you are a foot com connected to the organism and that therefore it is your duty, you know, that, you know that's your role. That's your function as a foot. Uh, then not only you're going to do it, you're actually going to embrace it. Right? You're going to be happy about this, right? That's the Amor Fati part. And what I argue in the field guide to a happy life is that that's not tenable anymore. That because if you reject, as I do, the notion of the universe as a living organism and that with logos, then you don't get providence. 
there the, the so-called traditional Stoics like Chris Fisher are right. I mean, when Chris says, you know, if you do away with, with providence, then, then you got a problem with the, you know, with the Stoic ethics. Yeah. Or if you reject God, the Stoic God, you have a problem with providence and therefore a problem with ethics. I think he's right. I think what he's wrong is, and therefore you shouldn't call yourself a Stoic. Now, wait a minute. Um, I can do a couple of things here. And the thing that I propose in, this, in, the, in, the, in the field guide is that we can get still much of Stoic ethics. The discipline of desire and aversion still holds. The discipline of action still holds. The discipline of assent still holds. It is still true that we should train ourselves to desire certain things that we normally don't desire, you know, to pursue. Let's not use the word desire because it's misleading. We should re basically realign our priorities. That's Epictetus. I agree. Uh, it is still true that we should uh, live virtuously within the human cosmopolis uh, and cooperate with other people. That's also Epictetus. That's the discipline of action. And it's still true that we should work very hard at improving our judgment so that we arrive at better decisions. And that's the discipline of assent. So much of the Stoic system and much particularly of the Epictetus system still holds. What about Amor Fati? Well, my, my attitude as a modern Stoic is... If something happens to me, let's say I get diagnosed with cancer, I'm not going to embrace it because it makes no sense for me to embrace it. I'm not, not going to love it. But what can I do? I, you know, it, it, is a, it is a thing. It's, it's happening. And so all I can do is to accept it and then see what I can do about it. Right? So it turns from embracing to endurance and action. It is what it is, um, and you know, it's not like I can magically wish it away. Um, I, sh I don't need to be happy about it. I just need to be accepting, to develop an attitude of equanimity toward things. You know, we know that, as, uh, as the, uh, uh, many of my atheist colleagues say, you know, shit happens. And when it happens, uh, what are you going to do? You can complain about it which, as you pointed out earlier, helps not at all. In fact, not only does it help, but it makes it worse because you add self-inflicted injury, psychological and emotional injury to the actual problem. Now, what you do is let's say, oh, well, I wasn't expecting this, but hey, um, now it is, it's here and I need to deal with it in the best, most rational or most compassionate, depending on what the actual situation, if it's somebody else is get, getting uh, diagnosed with cancer, then in that case, it's the most compassionate way possible. So you do, uh, so I do um, eliminate this notion of amor fati, mm -hmm, which I right. don't think is, is, you know, it's, it's tenable. Today. The reason this uh, came up in my work, uh, like uh, why you shouldn't complain is because uh, the argument that the Stoics, uh, which is quite unintuitive to the modern reader, uh, the argument the Stoics offered is that if you complain about things that happen, you're actually insulting the good and beautiful order of the universe. <laughs> right. Which, uh, actually, I kind of like that idea. I like <laughs> it. I like it, too. I mean, it's not, don't, don't get me wrong. It's not I don't appreciate those ideas. I mean, when Marcus, Marcus Rito says exactly that, like he says, you know, complaining about things is a form of impiety. Right. right. Because you're really complaining about how the universe is set up. Now, Epictetus, however... Um, puts it in an interesting way in some bits of the discourses, it puts it in a way that it's much more similar to what I am proposing, even though, as I said, it, it, does, it, it came at it from, from a different perspective. He basically says, look, um, if something happens, actually, this is Marcus, the analogy that I have in mind is Marcus. Marcus says at some point, um, even though he does talk about, you know, it's impiety to complain, et cetera, et cetera. But he says, so, so the cucumber is bitter. Don't eat it. Why, why do you have to complain about the fact that there are bitter cucumbers, right? If you just took a look at that and you don't go, you know, then he goes on and says, because it's also impious to, you know, like, well, forget the impiety part. That's really what it, the, the, the actionable part is the one that, that I just mentioned. It's like, okay, so there are certain things that are not good for you. In, you know, they're not, they're not to your liking in life. Well, if you can avoid them, avoid them. Why, why do you want to go on and complain? Oh, the universe is made that way. It's like, there's, there's no point in doing that sort of stuff. The problem, of course, is when you cannot avoid them. But there too, Marcus comes to your, to your rescue because he says, and I'm paraphrasing here, that if you find a, an obstacle in front of you, uh, then that obstacle might actually lead, indicate a different way of doing things, right? So, so uh, the obstacle leads to a, new, to a new way, which is actually a very Taoist way of looking at things. Right? The, right. There's a problem and go around it. 
One of the uh, conclusions that I came to, though, when I was thinking about this is that um, it doesn't really matter whether you, uh, you know, accept this idea of providence or not. But what, what I realized is that I think a lot of modern Stoics are missing an important part of um, what Stoicism was. And it's uh, this uh, attitude towards the cosmos that was part of the Pythagorean tradition and the Platonic tradition, the Stoic tradition, and also an attitude shared by many scientists. And that is that they recognize that we live in a incredible, uh, you know, beautiful tapestry of a cosmos, you know, governed by universal laws and harmonies, and that we've emerged from that and we ourselves are inextricably bound to that order which uh, is one of the ideas I explore in my book, like restoring the soul of the world, because the sense of wonder, you know, yeah. is the cosmological impulse. That's why people do science to begin with. Right. And that stoic attitude is obviously not in conflict with uh, modern science. I think it's actually supported by That's it. Right. And Einstein wrote quite a bit about this. He called it the cosmic religious feeling, mm -hmm. uh, which he said he, he found that to be the strongest and noblest motive for scientific research. And the thing that's interesting about Einstein is that he talks about this cosmic religious feeling, but he was not a religious person. He rejected belief right. in a personal God. Actually, uh, I just read that uh, if someone asked Einstein, do you believe in God? He would say, I believe in the God of Spinoza. That's right. But, um, and, as, and as we know, Spinoza was very strongly influenced by the Stoics. So, so really, Einstein was, was going, arching back all the way to the Stoic tradition, even though he might not have realized it. Right. And I have this quote from him, which is just astonishing, because um, he said in one of his essays that everyone who's made genuine advances in science, quote, is moved by profound reverence for the rationality made manifest in existence which he saw to be a kind of religious attitude. And that was something that uh, A.A. Armstrong talked about too in his uh, Stoicism talk from London in 2018. The cosmic connection is something that was really, you know, feeling this connection with the cosmos is yeah. something uh, that was essential uh, to the earlier Stoics that he fears could be lost in modern Stoicism. Absolutely. But, uh, that's let, me, so let me come up with, um, I, it just, I just remember another example that I want to bring up along the same lines. So when I said Marcus says, talks about the, the, the bitter cucumber, there's a part in Epictetus, there's a bit in Epictetus discourses, which I find hilarious. Um, and it speaks to, you know, the difference between Marcus and Epictetus is that Marcus is very serious. He's, he's a very dark character. It's like, you know, and you got to love him for that reason. I mean, I, I love the three big Stoics for very different reasons. Seneca is, much, is, is very humane. Seneca is the one that actually tells to his friend, Marcia, who's lost a, you know, an adult son a, a couple of years earlier. It's like, you know, of course, I understand you, you're grieving. I mean, I, you wouldn't be human if you were not grieving. But here, here's what, you know, here's what you want to do about it. But in the case of it is this, of course, sense of humor. There's, in fact, sometimes borderline sarcasm. Uh, there's a bit in the discourses where one of his students apparently is complaining about a running nose. And Peter says, what are you doing, man? So just wipe your nose. <laughs> what do you want? The entire universe to uh, rearrange itself so that there are no, no such thing as running noses? It's, it's like, really? Now, in that bit, just like in the bit from Marcus about the, the cucumbers, neither one of them goes on to say, you know, oh, you should embrace your fate. I'm sh that is what they thought. But, but what you get from those passages is just like, deal with it, man. It's, this, this is the way it is. Uh, what are you going to do? The universe isn't going to change itself in order to accommodate to your wishes. So it is up to you to understand how the universe works and act, act accordingly. Now, one major consequence of this, um, uh, further, I, I should say, consequence of this, however, is that in, my, in, the, in the field guide, I rephrase a number of passages where Epictetus himself, by modern standards, comes across as jarring. These are the famous passages where he says, remember, your child could die. Eh, don't worry about it. You know, don't, don't be disturbed by it. It's like, whoa, wait a minute. What do you mean don't, don't be disturbed about it? If my child dies, I'm going to pretty damn well uh, be disturbed about it. 
But it's not that, you know, sometimes people, uh, critics of Stoicism take it as an indication that Stoicism is a heartless philosophy and that Epictetus was, you know, was a psychopath or something. Nothing on the sort, of course, because if you understand it in context of what these people were thinking, this makes perfect sense. Right. Literally, the, your child dying, as much as it is a tragedy to you from your perspective, that's because you're looking at the thing from the point of view of the foot isolated from the body. But if you're looking at the, at the body as a whole, your child dying has a function, however unknown to you, in the, in the workings of the universe. And therefore, you should not only accept it, but actually be glad. It's like, oh, this is, this is happening because the universe needs it to, to happen. And that's it. Um, as I said, however, today, we really don't accept that sort of, that sort of consolation. Uh, it's great if you have it. I mean, if you believe in that, you know, good for you. But I don't. And so what does, that, what does that mean? Well, when the child dies, even as a stoic, I am per- completely entitled to feel grief. Uh, but I feel grief and I handle grief in the way Seneca says we should, right? So Seneca says, look, you don't want to be unfeeling. You don't want to be, you know, uh, like a stone. In fact, Epictetus himself, actually, in the, in the, Epi- in the in Caridian at some point says, you don't want to behave like a statue without feelings, you know, cold feelings, uh, right. being cold like a statue. You, you need to, to understand that human feelings are natural and unavoidable, Seneca says. So the real question isn't, uh, am I going to feel grief or not? The question is, what are you going to do about it? How are you going to react to the situation, right? And I think the modern Stoic training should be about training ourselves to accept, to, uh, to uh, um, expect what's going to happen because we know that we're going to lose our loved ones or friends and eventually, of course, ourselves. That's a fact of life. It happens, okay? Uh, it's unavoidable. And therefore, we should, number one, accept it as for what it is. And number two, prepare ourselves to those situations because those situations are really a test of our character. Seneca says that our own death is the, the ultimate test of our character. But the death of you know, your loved ones or your friends is also an important test of character. Um, and, and that's the way we should approach it. As I was taking my son out to breakfast this morning, I was trying to teach him a little bit about this and tell him that someday we're all going to die. You know, daddy, mommy, you, everyone. And I said, do you know who Marcus Aurelius is? And he said, no, well, I told him who Marcus was. And I said, well, he had uh, 13 children and only four of them survived to uh, adulthood, which is really quite tragic. Yeah. But... Um, I do think unfortunately it is. one of those was was uh, <laughs> <Come on. laughs> oh well <laughs> <Come on. laughs> but, but uh, I do think it's important to contemplate uh, the you know the fact that our loved ones are mortal because as Seneca said um, you will experience grief it's a natural human emotion there's no way to get around it but he said that people who experience extreme grief it's as though they somehow assumed they, they, they never assumed that their child was going to die. Right. So right. Um, Massimo, there was, there was one thing in the book that I strongly objected to. And I was wondering if okay. I could talk about that just for a minute. And then maybe, if, and then after that, we could talk about uh, just briefly go over your seven uh, points of methodology. Is, is that okay? Sure. Yeah, okay. sure. Cause I don't want to end on the one thing that I strongly objected to cause I don't <laughs> want to end on a negative point. So, and, and anyways, I, I really liked the book, but uh, there was one thing that stood out to me that the, and especially since you said that uh, you saw Epictetus as being a co-author because I don't think Epictetus or any of the Stoics would agree with this. So this is section 50 and uh, in the, uh, original translation, like the Robert, Robert, Robin Hard translation. It's whatever rules of conduct are set for you, hold to them as if they were laws, as if it would be an act of impiety for you to transgress them. Now, I understand why you would object to the word impiety, okay? Right. But then the way that uh, you change this is uh, you shouldn't just memorize these principles, but follow them every day as if they were laws of nature. I really like that. Though mm-hmm. keep in mind, as far as we can tell, there is no lawgiver or immutable cosmic essence. Right. Rather, what you have been learning is the result of human wisdom that originated from and, and has been applied to the human condition. Mm-hmm. And um, I can understand... Uh, why you said there is no lawgiver because you're trying to get away from this um, 
you know, kind of like, you know, theism. But in terms of um, there's no immutable cosmic essence, I don't think the Stoics would agree with that. I think, first of all, with um, Epictetus, when he said impiety, that may have only been rhetorical. Whether he meant that literally, I don't know. And I understand why you want to get rid of um, there's no lawgiver, but I think that immutable, there's no immutable cosmic essence is basically anti-Stoic. And I think all the ancient Stoics would have uh, vigorously uh, disagreed with that because they would have viewed logos, fate, logic, and similar things as being immutable cosmic principles. And what I'm afraid of, and, and also being a biologist, I realize why you're against essentialism because biologists don't like that, right? Because <laughs> everything's changing and evolving. That's right. But um, in Stoicism, one immutable cosmic essence that links all people together is logos, reason. And that's the idea that gave uh, birth to the idea of natural law and Cicero, and eventually to the idea of human rights. And so right. if you get rid of that idea, that there's no uh, immutable cosmic essence that links human beings together, you're ultimately undermining the idea of human rights. And then you could argue, like the sophists did, that man is the measure of all things uh, and not any kind of natural law, and that might makes right. Or as Nietzsche said, there are no truths, only perspectives. Right. So that's a great question. So, and, uh, so let me, let me just say yeah, one more no, thing. Go ahead. It's go also ahead. hard to believe that there's no immutable cosmic essence if you study mm -hmm. physics or look at, say, like Kepler's three laws of planetary motion. The way that it works is just like so perfect that there must be some underlying natural law there. Right. So anyways, that was just one thing that stuck out to well, me. That's, a, that's an so, interesting point you picked in, uh, on. Uh, so let me try to uh, explain... Uh, or defend, I guess, my, my position uh, on two different levels. On the, first of all, part of what I'm saying there is uh, what, I, what I say, it, you know, this is the result of human wisdom and so on and so forth. Um, I certainly don't want to go sophist on, on, on people. No. But, I want, <laughs> right, but I want people to acknowledge or to be aware or to remind themselves that um, uh, this is essentially an epistemic point, that even though we may think that we got the laws of nature down, the, the, the laws of causality down, et cetera, et cetera. This is still human knowledge and as such is fallible. And if it turns out in the future that things will, will, will reveal themselves to work differently, then we need to actually be flexible enough to update our system, right? So in, to some extent, this is an epistemological point. I like, see. And the Stoic themselves, there's a really interesting story um, about this in uh, John Sellers' The Art of Living. Uh, there is, he devotes an, a chapter to the ongoing discussion for more than a century between the Stoics and the skeptics about the nature of human knowledge, right? And, and it shows very nicely that the two schools actually informed each other and kind of modified each position, each other's position to the point that toward the, toward the end, they kind of converged because they started out very differently. For the skeptics, there's simply no such thing as human knowledge. Therefore, you should hold to no opinion. Uh, you know, you should just neutral about everything. For the Stoics, and, and absolutely there is such a thing as human knowledge, although only the sage might arrive that, there, but <clears throat> there is such a thing as certain knowledge. And so the, you know, the, 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 uh, the skeptics pointed out, like, no, wait a minute, that, that just doesn't, you know, even, even the sage is going to have the fallibility of human beings, you know, human, human judgment, et cetera, et cetera. The Stoics said, yeah, but on the other hand, um, if you really don't hold to any opinion, uh, because you want to be uh, uh, you know, neutral about everything, then on what basis are you going to decide to act or not to act? It's like what you do, do act randomly, you know, flip a coin or throw a dice or something like that. So by the end of the discussion, which took more than a century, kind of the skeptics kind of agreed that, yeah, all right, well, some opinions are better than others. And, and so you're going to go on a probabilistic fashion, right? If you think that there is some opinions are actually, you know, you may still want to hold them lightly, but... Uh, but it is true that you have to make decisions and, and some opinions are, in fact, not all opinions are equally neutral from that perspective. And the Stoics acknowledge that, well, okay, maybe the sage will or will not have knowledge. It doesn't matter because most of us are not sages anyway. And yes, it's true that other things being equal for the rest of us, it's a good idea to hold our opinions lightly, right? And in fact, if you, if you, see, you see that throughout the Stoic literature where they say, you know, just be careful about your, your judgment. That's why Epictetus is so much into improving your judgment because judging things correctly is in fact very difficult, right? Um, right. It's important so to it, yeah. withhold judgment, uh, especially leading up to a presidential election <laughs> yeah. uh, in terms of the news stories that you read. 
And yeah. I'm not talking about one side or the other. I'm talking about both sides. <laughs> yeah, 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 no, I agree. Now, that said, so in part of what I was making there in the passage you read was an epistemological point, although right. I could have made it a little bit more clear. Then there is a little more subtle point that I'm so interested. It's so fascinating from, from, to me that you actually picked up on it because it's really not, it cannot possibly be clear what that is coming from. But I was thinking about a specific thing. I was thinking about a uh, controversial modern physicist, Lee Smolin, mm -hmm. who I admire a lot and I read a lot of his, of his stuff. And, you know, being controversial, he probably is wrong on, you know, 80% of the stuff that he writes. It doesn't, but, but he has some interesting ideas. And one of the things that he, um, acknowledge, that, that he puts forth in a couple of his books is that the laws of nature themselves actually are emergent from basic interactions of cause and effect. In other words, they're not basic. They are the result of their emergent property. And, and he said, it's possible, therefore, that the nature of the interactions of cause and effect will change over time. Uh, it certainly changed, very likely changed bef between before and after the Big Bang, for instance. Uh, and therefore, what we call laws of nature themselves are only actually empirical, empirical generalizations. They're not really laws they might change. Of course, if they do, he immediately says, they do so over cosmic uh, you know, uh, uh, spatial scales and, and billions of years in terms of temporal scales. But nevertheless, that might be changeable. And we, may, we need to be um, aware of the possibility that nothing is written in stone in the universe, not even the laws of nature themselves, right? So right. part of what I'm saying there is kind of a, doing a nod, making a nod to this thing that we don't know at a cosmic level, if things, if there is really any essence that is unchangeable and things like that. However, for all effective purposes, of course, that makes no difference for us because we don't live at a cosmic level. We, we live at, a, at a, both a spatial scale and a temporal scale where for all effective purposes, laws of nature are in fact unchangeable and, and, you know, that, and that's the end of the story. In a sense, if you want an analogy from geometry, it's like, you know, we all know that the universe doesn't follow uh, Euclidean geometry, but for all effective purposes, most of the time when we're on earth, that's good enough. Uh, you know, it's, it's, if I walk down Brooklyn, uh, you know, outside of my apartment, I don't need spherical geometry in order to tell me where to go. It's flat, flat surfaces are more than enough, but I am aware of the fact that that's not the, that's not a fundamental truth. It just happens to be a contingent truth that I can use to navigate my world. Right. Actually, uh, Rupert Sheldrake wrote about that as well. Uh, he, he questioned whether the constants of nature are really entirely constant and also, uh, for example, whether the laws uh, that exist now in the cosmos were always the same because there's no way that you can prove. I mean, I mean with, uh, for example, like the Big Bang, uh, right. that that would exactly conform to the laws of our current cosmic epoch. So right. it does, I mean, it does make sense. I mean, yeah, it, you just have it, to withhold judgment in a sense. Correct. Uh, it's just that um, in, in a sense, I think I, I understand what you're doing now. You're, you're just practicing epistemological humility. That's, right. <laughs> That's a very, thank you. That's a very charitable way to put it. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> So to, 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 to wrap up here, I was just wondering if we could quickly go through your seven criteria. I sure. have a list of them here and just briefly mention them to give the reader, the, the listeners, an idea of the criteria that you used. Is, is that okay? Yes, of course. Okay. So the first one, um, you think the stoic idea that we should despise externals uh, should go. And for example, like Seneca talks a lot, a lot about that, like you should despise wealth and things like that, even though he was very wealthy. So, um, right. and then what you say in the book, which would be coming from Epictetus is don't put your happiness in the whimsical hands of fortune, basically. And so uh, I do agree that uh, there may have been too much emphasis on despising externals, but I also wonder, especially with Seneca, whether that was sort of like a rhetorical technique that he was using. So, but anyways, I, I agree with that. Uh, and then no need to cultivate. Sorry, you, you, may, you may be right that it's, to some extent, it's a rhetorical technique, partly because we know that he actually did not despise um, right. you know, externals. But I think it's important to, uh, to bring it up because too, mu too, much, um, too often modern stoicism 
has these, it's criticized on that basis. Like, uh, oh, you, you're despising external. It's like, what about a normal human life? And so people tend to go Aristotelian, basically, although they might not realize that they're going Aristotelian. And there is, even in the early stories, there is no despising of externals. Externals are very clearly defined as uh, something that can be selected, can be reasonably selected or diselected, right? Preferred or dispreferred. And in fact, uh, even Seneca himself, for all his despising, uh, at some point he says to, uh, to his friend Lucilius, like, you know, um, pleasure is in accordance with nature and, and pain is in disagreement with nature. Now, what is it? What happened there? Did he turn Epicurean all of a sudden? No. All he's saying is that other things being equal, and the big one here is unless it gets in the way of your practice of virtue, of course you want to seek pleasure and avoid pain. The only, the only exceptions, because those are respectively preferred and dispreferred, uh, and there is nothing problematic about that, the only exception is, of course, uh, uh, when they get, when doing so gets in the way of your practice in virtue. Even Epictetus, for all his stern sort of version of stoicism, he says, so you're asking me, uh, you know, why are you not making money in order to help my friends and, and your city? And he says, well, yeah, if there is a good way, you know, meaning a virtuous way to do, to make money, I will. But if you're asking me to compromise my character and my integrity, then I say, no, I'm sorry, that's not the, the thing that I want to do. Right. I found this last part of the book to be very helpful where you outlined your methodology as well as giving the chart about all the things that you changed. Uh, in, in your uh, new version of the Enchiridion. Uh, the second one was, uh, there's no need to cultivate indifference to human loss, which we already discussed. So that's a good principle, I think. Uh, now you think you can get, we can uh, uh, do away with uh, live according to nature as well. And part of that is because living according to nature, the way you explained it is it, it deals with this idea of uh, stoic providence, which you don't find to be tenable in the modern world. Um, as a counterbalance to that, I'll just mention one thing. And that is, uh, there were many different stoic interpretations of live according to nature, because it could also mean just be rational and, and virtuous as human beings, because that's what human nature intrinsically is. So... No, that, that I agree. Um, uh, what I'm objecting there is the way the ancient Stoics derived it, particularly when, I thought, when we're talking about the nature of the cosmos, right? So they, they actually interpreted living according to nature in two different respects, particularly Chrysippus did, uh, you know, universal nature and human nature. Mm -hmm. And I don't necessarily, I don't actually reject the notion as much as reinterpret it that living according to human nature means living according to the best, option, the best aspects of what it means to be a biological being member of the homo sapiens species. And in that sense, you're absolutely right. Those, those characteristics are our pro-sociality, you know, uh, cooper a cooperative uh, uh, behavior with others and our capacity for reason. At a cosmic level, I more radically reinterpret living according to nature. Of course, I cannot avail myself of the notion of a living organism and that would logos, but living according to nature at a cosmic level just means, as uh, Larry Baker put it, follow the facts, meaning accept that you, you live in a universe that works in a certain way and don't engage in wishful thinking about how the universe should work or may work or, or, or you want to change it. The universe is the way it is and it has nothing, there's nothing you can do about it. Right. So your fourth uh, methodological point is, uh, uh, to eliminate questionable science or metaphysics. So for example, to like eliminate the belief in divination, which uh, right. I think most people would agree with that. So. Yeah, that's a, that's a simple one, right? That's, that's an easy one. <laughs> uh, number five, gods or atoms. And uh, <clears throat> I'm just, I just wanted to make one comment on this is because I think that, uh, I think there's actually a misinterpretation in this section uh, where you uh, claimed that the Stoics believe that the universe was not just an organism, but actually sentient. And actually, uh, logos just means in, like intelligent organization. It has like about seven different meanings. And uh, I've mm -hmm. studied this for quite a long time. I'm quite sure about this. I gave a talk at the last Stoicon called uh, the Stoic Cosmopolis, Why We're Born to be Ethical. And uh, I'll put a link to that below this video in case people want to read about it. But in terms of uh, the actual quotations where Stoics said that the universe was sentient, I don't believe that's actually solid. 
because there's one quote attributed to Zeno and Cicero that's not really backed up by any other sources. And uh, this also, I believe that the Stoic view is that while human beings uh, participate in logos in the fullest sense, that logos is actually distributed throughout the entire cosmos. So right. I'm just going to throw that out there as a point. And uh, that's an important, now that's an interesting point. And you know, I, I yes, I remember your, your, your talk now. Um, I guess for one thing, there are still, we still do have those quotes that you say are not found anywhere else, but you know, the fact that something is not found anywhere else is kind of, uh, we need to tread carefully because as you know, we lost 99% of the stoic writings, especially the early ones. So like, you know, well, it's only in a couple of places. Uh, well, to me, that's, it's, it's, it's interesting that it is in a couple of places because, um, because we lost so much of the stoic literature, but even if you take, so, but let's say that, that uh, we, we agree that I agree with your interpretation of things, even that one, I find problematic from a modern perspective, right? Because I don't believe that, uh, the logos is is present throughout the universe even if it doesn't make the universe itself sentient then it's beginning to sound to me something like along the lines of panpsychism mm -hmm. um right and which is a philosophical position that i very strongly reject i've written about this sort of thing so i just either way you cut it you slice it in other in other terms you know if you think that the the cosmos itself is a living organism endowed with some kind of sentient, or if you think that, that the logos is distributed throughout, I don't think it's distributed throughout. I think it's distributed right here uh, mm -hmm. in human beings. Um, and to some extent in, in other uh, perhaps uh, primates and mammals, it may be distributed in other places in the universe, of course, because, you know, we, we cannot say that we are the only uh, beings in the universe capable of reason, but it's not distributed throughout the universe, meaning that it's not right. a, all a but fundamental property of it. The, the way that I'm uh, referring to it, though, is just that um, is that uh, the, the is that there are like laws of nature that follow rational patterns in that sense. Yeah, that's that like, I agree. That yeah. I agree. But I think that's, that, that's a stretch. That, that's like you know the weak form of it. But I think that's something yeah. that you know most people would agree with. I mean, that's and uh, you know that's why science works with, because we yeah. can understand the rationality. Yeah. On that uh, one, I completely agree. Yes. Yeah. On that part, so, I completely agree. Yeah. Uh, then uh, point six: local customs are neither universal nor immutable. Obviously, that's true. Um, now, one little problem that I had here is that, um, I mean, it's fine; it's your book, but uh, you <laughs> removed all the references to slavery. Yeah. And um, I just have a little problem with that because. If you go back to traditional Stoicism, obviously slavery was part of the culture. It's not obviously not part of our culture, unless you live in Madagascar or someplace like that where it may still exist. But right. uh, for the early Stoics, slavery was very important because it was um, the opposite of slavery was freedom. And so they're constantly using slavery as a symbol uh, that you know that's what what you don't want to be as a human being right. you don't want to be enslaved right. uh, to various things and so that's part of like the vocabulary of yeah. stoicism even though yeah uh, it's no longer something that exists the other thing too is that if you take like all if you were to sort of like sanitize stoicism and take references to slavery out of it that would also like eliminate the understanding that the Stoics were at the beginning of a line of thinkers that led to the development of human rights and the elimination of slavery on a global basis. No, I agree. I agree. So the, the, the reason I uh, don't refer to slavery there is because I sort of assume that that's a, a non-controversial point at this point, that we can get rid of that, right. of that notion. Right. What I do list, on the other hand, are the things that are also in the ancient Stoics, like, for instance, striking your, your, your child uh, in order to you know, make him behave correctly, or uh, references uh, to women being sort of somehow you know, inf partially inferior human beings, even though, as you know, the Stoics are actually at the forefront there as well. So basically what I was trying to say is like, look, obviously there are certain things that we don't even need. I hope we don't need to discuss even like slavery. Um, but there are others that people, my people still today, some people do think that women are in fact, you know, biologically different and cognitively different and, and they ought not to be treated in the same way. So I focused on those things that I 
figured might still be controversial or at least debatable today and sort of skipped on the stuff. But you're right. If, you're, if we're ever doing an historical analysis of stories, and that would definitely have to be there. Absolutely. And fact, yeah, yeah. yeah. And then the last, the last point was uh, social justice, uh, which um, you think some people find to be controversial. So uh, some, some of my lighthearted joke about this is... Have you been on my Twitter feed lately? No, no. <laughs> but my, my joke about this is, Massimo, are you saying that um, modern Stoics aren't woke enough? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Exactly. Well, some of them definitely are not. Maybe, arguably, all of us are not, but some uh, of them, it's particularly obvious that they're not. Now, as you know, there, is, um, there are a couple of, um, uh, in, my, in my opinion, distortions of modern Stoicism uh, that I think we need to resist as Stoics, as modern Stoics. Uh, one of them has to do with what I call Stoicism with a dollar sign. Yes. So this, right. So the Silicon Valley uh, or, or athlete coaching kind of thing where, oh, yeah, use Stoic techniques to become a billionaire or use Stoic techniques to, to have your business going well. It's like, no. I mean, sure, you can use the techniques. I mean, every, anybody can use the techniques just in the same way in which you know, anybody can meditate. And that doesn't mean because, for, let's say, for instance, in order to uh, uh, to manage uh, chronic, chronic pain or stress, but that doesn't make them Buddhists, right? Um, it's, it's, in fact, it's not even a requirement to meditate in order to be a Buddhist. If, to be Buddhist means you buy into the philosophy. And so I get a little bit annoyed when people uh, say, oh, the stoicism that, that allows you to you know, um, become rich and, and famous because that is definitely not what stoicism is about. If your main goal in life is to become rich or famous, then you really are missing the point uh, of the whole thing. You can still say, well, I'm not a stoic, but I'm going to use some of these techniques because they work. That's fine. Um, but, but it's not stoicism. The more problematic, the even more problematic uh, sort of distortion of stoicism, in my mind at least, is what sometimes is referred to as broicism, uh -huh. uh, which is popular in certain quarters of the internet that have to deal with men's rights and, and fairly significant dose of misogyny and things like that, right? And these are the people that say, oh, look, uh, the, the term virtue uh, comes from the Latin ver, which means men. So it's obviously about manly things. And look, Marcus Aurelius, you know, talks about, uh, well, actually, Marcus doesn't do that much, but, but Seneca says, you know, don't be a woman, you know, and that sort of stuff. Well, yeah, but the reason they're saying that those things is because that was a reflection of the culture of the time, right? Being womanly meant a certain thing within that culture. They seem to forget a number of other things. First of all, the ver in Latin is actually a translation of arete, which means excellence, which is gender neutral. So right there, there's no particular reason to say, to think in terms of manliness. But more importantly, uh, they think they, they seem, these people uh, focus on, on the virtue of courage, let's say, while at the same time apparently ignoring the virtue of justice and the two are completely interconnected you cannot for the stoics you cannot be courageous but unjust in fact your courage is moral courage it's the courage to do the right thing not not the courage to go into battle or the courage to you know beat somebody up that's not that's got nothing to do with with stoicism and again we also need to be giving credit to the stoics that even though certainly they were not social justice warriors by modern standards, and certainly they were not, you know, feminists even by modern standards or anything like that, nevertheless, they were among the few ancient philosophers who explicitly stated that women have the same mental abilities as men, and therefore they ought to study and practice philosophy and, and be virtuous. Um, they also very explicitly uh, engaged in social reform. I mean, often Stoicism, ancient Stoicism is presented as a sort of a, a conservative thing that only Roman aristocrats uh, subscribe to. But people forget that uh, Cato the Younger took up, uh, you know, literally took up arms against Julius Caesar because he thought that, that Caesar was a tyrant. Uh, there is a whole slew of, of Stoic uh, philosophers and senators named, uh, nicknamed the Stoic opposition that went up against uh, the tyranny of Nero, Vespasian, and Domitian. And Epictetus himself was one of those. He was sent into Nicopolis, into exile, precisely by Domitian, precisely because he was getting annoying. He was, he was speaking, you know, uh, truth to power, as, as we would say today. So uh, all these thing, elements are there, but of course they are, in the original Stoicism, they are dampened by the fact that that, that was the, a different cultural milieu. And, and so I think it's important in, uh, in a modern sense to... Uh, 
acknowledge that those things are not incidentally there. They're there because they actually follow logically from Stoic philosophy. Stoic philosophy entails feminism, understood as women should be treated just as, as, as men. Um, Stoicism, I think, entails social justice, not understood as, you know, this particular issue or that particular issue. We need to discuss, you know, issues need to be discussed on a, on a, a single, you know, individual basis. But social justice in the sense that we ought to move towards society where things are more fair and more just for, for everybody. You know, how we do that, that's definitely a conversation to be had. And I don't think we, sh we should think of stoicism as a, you know, as a political party. I, I would hate to see somebody run, running as the, as the stoic representative for, for president. It's like, no, that's not going to be a good idea because there are many different ways to actually achieve the stoic ideal of cosmopolitanism, uh, justice, and courage. Yeah, uh, Stoicism really was the original form of uh, social justice in its uh, true sense. Yeah, um, I just have a bit of uh, caution about the term social justice now because of all the things that uh, are thrown under that umbrella, yeah. including, uh, for example, like interse intersectionality. Uh, and uh, since you're a keen student of um, pseudoscience, <laughs> there's a lot of pseudoscience uh, that yeah. under social justice, unfortunately. Yeah. And uh, the problem with intersectionality, for example, is that it's based on um, dividing people into different tribes and then figuring out, you know, who's been the most oppressed and, you know, then striving for power and things like that. And that really goes against the idea of the Stoic Cosmopolis, that, that yeah. we're all one brotherhood and sisterhood of humanity yeah. and that everyone is... I agree and combined am, or joined together by reason. Yeah, I agree. I'm I am bothered by too much intersectionality and you know and subdivision of groups and subgroups in especially in the modern left. Even though I consider myself politically, you know, sort of a left leaning liberal, etc. Um, but I think so. On the one hand, I think it is reasonable and just to recognize that certain groups in society have been, you know, historically discriminated against and are still discriminated against today. And that needs to be rectified. However, the way to do that in my mind is not to divide and conquer into, you know, a bunch of different groups is, is precisely to go back to the notion that we're all members of the human cosmopolis, we're all brothers and sisters. And so nobody should be discriminated against no matter what their religion, creed, gender, uh, ethnicity, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We should all be on the same level uh now we as i said we recognize that in order to get there right now in the moment we need to rectify certain specific types of injustice but the goal should be a cosmopolitan one not not right. uh, one of, of pitting one one group against in, in another yeah i definitely agree with that and i'll just say as a footnote that um my greatest love in the world is the humanities and it saddens me to no end the way that the humanities have been destroyed by taking the subject matter of the humanities and then turning them into debates about race, gender, class, power, <laughs> colonialism, et cetera. It's really been bad. And uh, <clears throat> I think it's gonna take a long time to uh, get beyond that. But anyways, that editorial, editorializing aside, I wanna end with one question for you. And this is about um, gratitude, because in your book with uh, Gregory Lopez, you mentioned the idea of feeling grateful uh, several times. And uh, there's this wonderful uh, quote from Marcus Aurelius about gratitude that for me sums up the stoic idea of gratitude. And I wanted to get your opinion on this to see if you would agree with this. And he says, everything that is harmonious with you, O universe, suits me also. Nothing is too early or too late for me that is timely for you. Everything that your seasons bring is fruit for me, O nature. All things are from you, in you, and all things return to you. Yeah, is that something right? you can identify with? Yes, um, I think I would, um, if, if, I think we, if we were having a conversation with Marcus, Marcus will tell you that he, de he derives that kind of sentiment, sentiment in a different way from which I would derive it. And that of course is again, part of the project of, of the uh, field guide to a happy life. But yes, I agree with the sentiment. I think it can be interpreted in modern sense as, as essentially saying, look, we, we owe our existence to the universe. We, come back, we go back to the universe. Everything comes from uh, the rest of the universe and we should be grateful for whatever we get. Um, right. and you know, and the rest, we just, we just, um, you know, we focus as Epictetus, one of my, my favorite bits in Epictetus is where he says, don't be a fool and don't, don't wish for figs in winter. 
right? Right. Um, right. That is a beautiful metaphor. It's like, yeah, that's right. I love figs, but I don't want figs all, all year round because I cannot have them. They're not there. And so what that means is that I don't need, I don't want to regret not having figs when they're not, not in season, but at the same time, when they are in season, I'm going to eat them. I'm going to enjoy them. I'm going to do whatever, you know, the best I can in order to take whatever the universe and enjoy whatever the universe gives me, but not regret it when it Right. I just thought I'd throw that out there because that quote actually is, uh, at least in my book, that's my uh, favorite expression of the uh, idea of amor fati is, you know, the universe gives us these things. So we should be grateful for whatever comes our way. So yeah. in any event, uh, Massimo, it's been uh, really great speaking with you. I really uh, admire your work uh, Thank you. greatly. Um, I really admire what you bring to Stoicism because of your philosophical background. Uh, you're really unique in that respect um, because not only uh, do you have a passionate love for Stoicism, but you have this incredible background in philosophy that allows you to take Stoic ideas and update them and also compare them with contemporary thought and uh, you know, test it against uh, you know, contemporary knowledge. So I think that's very valuable. Really appreciate it. Uh, I really recommend this book. And uh, my name is uh, David Feidler. I want to thank you for joining us. And you'll find links to uh, Massimo's books uh, below this video. And uh, if you enjoyed this conversation, uh, please visit the Stoic Insights website and also subscribe to the YouTube channel so you'll be informed about future videos when they're published. So thank you very much, Massimo, and ho hopefully we can speak again soon. It's been a pleasure, David. See you soon. Okay. Great. Talk to you later. <laughs>